Welcome to this week's episode of The Appetite, a podcast that explores one's appetite for life as it relates to food, body, and mental health. We are clinicians from Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment center in Seattle, Washington. I'm your host, Carter Umhau, and I'm joined by the Opal founders, Dr. Lexi Giblin, Kara Bazzi, Julie Church. In last week's episodes, this week's, and next week's, we are exploring the three main tenets of Opal as a way to introduce ourselves. Today, we continue this by introducing the paradigm-shifting movement of health at every size, which removes weight from the definition of health and offers a much more nuanced look at what it means to be healthy. Julie Church is our go-to person in today's conversation. She is a health at every size expert and regularly trains professionals and local community members on this topic. She also infuses our nutrition programming at Opal with the tenets of health at every size. As you get to know us, you'll notice that we constantly are referring to health at every size as HAES. HAES, H-A-E-S, is an acronym. We are definitely not talking about hazing people here. I promise. Great. All right, let's go. Okay. Here we are. So today we're going to be focusing on health at every size, which you'll hear us refer to over and over again as HAYS, little acronym. Um, and we will be kind of starting with Julie Church. Can you explain to us what HAYS is <laughs> to start things off? Yeah, I think it would be great to just start with how I found it. And okay. I think that's going to help great. explain what it is and why I found it and what it is. So I was in my undergraduate program in nutrition. And I remember distinctly having a professor come in, um, a guest guest lecture, I guess, in a medical nutrition therapy class. And they were talking about the problem of obesity and weight. Mm -hmm. And he came in presenting about some research that they were doing at the local hospital. And he had these graphs and showed results and what people were doing. And I just sat there, the lecture thinking, he thinks that's really great. <laughs> and there's something about that he thinks is really successful and is leading to good outcomes and is helping people. And I was looking at this graph that didn't look very impressive to me. And I recognized, wow, I think I might have some different ideas about weight and my and how I might pursue working as a dietitian than maybe the mainstream thinking. And I didn't know that going into nutrition. Mm. And so I sought out just different learning that was outside of the curriculum, um, that was mainstream nutrition curriculum, and was brought to intuitive eating um, and attuned eating and some of the things related to that. Um, and then it brought me to the health at every size um, world. And the health at every size is a phrase that's trademarked by the Association of Size, Diversity, and Health. And it is something that has been formed over years, uh, lots of different disciplines and movements and Types of people have been involved in creating this term and the movement that is health at every size. So it's not just a philosophy. It's a movement. Mm -hmm. It's not just a phrase. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, okay. So can you explain kind of what, what makes up this movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in a quick little way to say it, I guess, mm -hmm. um, the Association of Size, Diversity, and Health um, describes health at every size as it's a, a means to support people in pursuing health habits for the sake of health and well-being rather than weight control. So the way that I phrase it is just saying that it's moving away from weight as the central proxy for health. Mm. And it's not just about um, thinking about nutrition and exercise and weight, but it is thinking about the broader um, – aspects around society and and the way that um, healthcare is organized and the systems that are involved in that um, and thinking about how all people can access care, healthcare and be treated respectfully as they're walking down the street or if they're in a provider relationship, provider and client relationship. So this is a pretty revolutionary idea, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, if mm -hmm. I was just thinking about like looking at a magazine stand and the emphasis mm -hmm. on weight mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the main mm -hmm. signifier of health. Right. So to, to sh turn that on its head is a pretty big deal mm -hmm. in our culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that the there is a strong body of research behind health at every size. Um, and there's wonderful researchers out there that have put together things that are, are um, really 
convincing. Mm-hmm. Um, and the there's so there's a lot out there also that is going to somehow be interpreted to state that there still is weight as the most important central part of health. We can get into more of the research that gets interesting. Um, <laughs> but I I think yes the the focus on um, weight as this one thing that's always going to help us define health is so discouraging to me. And I think I would put it this way, is when we think about health at every size, it's just it's just naming the reality that we cannot look across the street and determine if somebody is healthy. Um, we can't. We can't look at the size of one's body um, and make a determinant about what their cardiometabolic health is, um, what their glucose markers are, and if they're pre-diabetic or diabetic. We can't see if they have mental health issues or not, like you just can't make those. Um, but there, there is a lot of mainstream, um, that's, that's taught to us that we can, I would say. So, and the mainstream thought is that we can make that assessment. Um, and then that has also been, I believe, so mm, intertwined into the way that medicine is also practiced in a conventional way. So, We also talk about how we can't look at a person across the street and make assumptions about how they eat or how they exercise right. based on their body shape. Yeah. Which again, mm-hmm. a lot of people have those implicit biases mm-hmm. about body shape. Yeah. And what that means about their behaviors. Yes. Yes. And it, two of the tenets of health at every size are eating for well being and life enhancing movement. Mm. Uh, so those two, you know, in terms of exercise and nutrition, they certainly have pieces to the mm-hmm. puzzle that create this paradigm shift around health at every size. Mm-hmm. So I'm kind of imagining already for listeners that there are things right off the bat that are going to be um, a little bit shaky about this idea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm imagining like what it what it would actually take for someone to lean into the idea that that their weight isn't a massive indicator of their health. Mm-hmm. Are there typical questions or pushbacks that you get from people mm-hmm. when you present this idea? Mm-hmm. It's interesting yes. because I would say that, yes, we get a lot of pushbacks, yeah. but then I also usually pretty quickly into a conversation, people can identify people in their life that they knew that have these con- significant health issues that then are also in a smaller size body versus maybe the people that they know that are in larger size bodies and don't have significant health issues. So I I, I want to stay, I guess, hopeful and like create that opportunity to believe that this isn't that crazy and radical. Mm-hmm. And I understand it is. <laughs> um, so I, I recognize I like, that. I like that you said that. Yeah. <laughs> um, because usually people can get there, but then it still doesn't make them totally convinced of it. Uh, but I would say that people can remember and note and see and recognize the things that do um, confirm that, wait, maybe weight isn't everything about health. So. OK, but some pushbacks. Yes. You some so pushbacks. Some pushbacks. I start, I start with pushbacks. What'd you say? Diabetes. So disease. Diabetes. Yes, let's talk about, I mean, that's one of the big pushbacks, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, most people have an idea that some of the main, um, like some of the larger diseases that are um, troubling people, especially in America, but across the globe, um, have weight as one of the things that needs to be fixed in order for that disease to be prevented Mm -hmm. or to be lessened in terms of the impact on their overall health, mortality. Um, So the main thing that's really coming out in um, more current research around that is that there are so many factors that impact somebody to develop diabetes. And in that, um, we have to look at all of those things. And perhaps, and what they're showing more and more, is that weight is one of the things that is correlated with Um, somebody Mm -hmm. also developing diabetes, but it doesn't mean that it is a causation of diabetes. So as these other factors that are environment and society and uh, stress factors and socioeconomic status and race and And genetics, genetics Mm -hmm. and uh, genetics is huge. (laughs) Um, All these things are happening for somebody and then they end up having pre-diabetic glucose markers or they are di- they are diagnosed with diabetes, um, at the same time these things are happening, their weight might be increasing. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that weight then is um, the cause of it and then also the treatment of it. Mm-hmm. So that that's one of the quickest things that people believe is that, okay, well, if I've been diagnosed with this, I need to lose weight. And that – I could just keep talking on it. Mm-hmm. But, um, the you know, the – 
the reality is that we see with a health at every size approach is that we would say that we want for somebody that desires for their health to be improved if they have diabetes and they've been diagnosed with that. We want for somebody, if they desire to have an effort put forth, forth in improving their diabetic markers, like the glucose and things like that, great. We want to support them in that. And we don't believe that focusing just on weight loss is going to get them to actually improve health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's worth highlighting again. Correlation does not equal causation. Yes. I feel yeah. like that's a another another yeah. big pushback. Um I think we I, we get I've heard is around the obesity epidemic. So how do you how does Julie what would okay. Hayes would say, say yeah. regarding yes. the obesity epidemic? So I'll, the fear. Quote. That mm -hmm. is a great question. Okay. Okay. So the most the thing that I go back to is a Belgian astronomer <laughs> um, that discovered and loved uh, the bell curve in the 1800s and saw that he could plot the population in Belgium um, on and it was a bell curve in terms of weight. And they thought, wow, look at this. I could do BMI, weight and height. And look at that. This is a nice bell curve. And that's what that was the first use of or the creation of the BMI. Um, and then um, in the 1940s, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company then adopted that chart as something that they could use to then decide on how much they would charge their participants Ooh. in the, their insurance company. Mm. So it was really just people, some man, an astronomer, it was an astronomer. That created that it just because he likes bell curves. Because <laughs> we, can, we can plot population yeah, on a right. bell curve. Right. Yes. It's just plotting yes. data points. Yes. And I think one of the main important things that I would say, I know I'll get back to this like obesity epidemic. I guess I would be a little bit. Is that a little bit totally of an offshoot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's um, helpful. But the, this BMI is what most people are using to consider. There's an issue around obesity. Look at that. Everyone's BMIs are increasing and increasing and increasing. And this is a problem. So I come back to the history on BMI to start there. Because then when even the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company was trying to use this as a means to do that and then integrate it, they had lobbyists and activists within their company trying to get the medical community to adopt it. And then the medical community was super resistant at the time mm. um, to adopt it, but they did end up adopting it. And obviously then it's now we're in this, you know, you know, um, decades beyond that. And it's just natural to think, oh, BMI and medicine, they just go together. Mm -hmm. But to, to remember that back then, that the medical community didn't want that as a part of their practice. And so I think it's good to remember that. Mm -hmm. But um, And isn't there a fun story about the BMI change overnight? Yes, totally. Keto. So that Same. is in the 90s, yes. And this was the other thing that's so convincing when we hear the obesity epidemic. People use that phrase because they see it, this total change and increase, and it's something that's going out of control, and there's nothing that's causing, or nothing's stopping it. Um, one of the things that we um, have to look at, too, is that, yes, in the late 90s, um, the BMI numbers, so the number that would have put somebody in a normal category on the BMI versus the overweight category versus the obese category, were changed. So tens of millions of people jumped categories. Mm -hmm. So maybe they were in the normal category, and then overnight, they then became, quote, unquote, overweight, and then from the overweight category, jumped into the obese category. So that when they say that the numbers have increased so much over time, that is a huge factor as mm -hmm. to why we can see the numbers theoretically showing more and more obesity. Mm -hmm. So Crazy. It's yeah. So disturbing. So, yeah. Julie, are you say, saying that um, people aren't actually getting bigger? Okay. So there isn't necessarily – I <laughs> <laughs> say that it's just so playfully. Yeah. Little yeah. devil's <laughs> advocate, advocate of eyebrows are raising I'm throwing, over there. I'm throwing <laughs> the <laughs> questions out that yeah. I hear yeah. that I yeah. get myself. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So, no, I – the the – General population study, when you look at them, that is, it's not increasing to the level that everyone thinks. So, mm -hmm. and what's, what's also, yeah, I could go on and on of reasons why weight is not something that needs to be so focused on and fixed. Cause I think, okay, there's actually the, the people that live the longest are the people in the overweight category and the BMI, if we're going to just use the category categories like that. So, okay. So are we saying that that's so detrimental to mm -hmm. the fullness of life and to what people want? I, you know, and it, I, we could go into all many, so many conversations, but then yeah. I go, well, what is health and what do people want for, what is well-being? What is, mm -hmm. what do people want from life? And um, if they just want to fit into the chart to be normal, quote unquote, on the BMI chart, um, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that I, I don't see that as full life, but when they say mm -hmm. just general population studies show that health can happen in all of these categories across the board, we can't, we can't miss that mm -hmm. fact. 
and the opportunity and the hope in that and the just truth in it too. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and part of the part of what I think of is that even if if um, if you said I want to lose weight and that is that is what will make my life worth living, this mm-hmm. is very important to me. I want to lose weight. Mm-hmm. Part of the the problem is that if you if you set about to lose weight, you're likely not going to maintain that weight loss mm-hmm. anyway. So even if you had that as a goal, mm-hmm. the very goal that you may be putting a lot of efforts into will likely not be effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You want to speak about something around that, like the biggest mm-hmm. loser or things that mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of listeners yes. probably yeah, are I, interacting with, right? right? Because yeah. most people sustainable might, weight loss. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because most people would think that they are supposed to get to a certain mm-hmm. weight and that they just need to lose it and then they'll stay there forever right. once they get there and okay. then are heartbroken that totally. that doesn't mm-hmm. really happen very yeah. naturally. Mm-hmm. And how many times have we heard I my body naturally is, you know, five or ten pounds lighter and I just have to get to that five or ten pounds and then I'll be okay and we'll just resume life as normal. I feel like that's a really common mm-hmm. statement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for other people, it's losing the 50 pounds that they've lost ten times over their life. Right. Right? And not even the five to ten pounds. Yeah. Oh, We're so throwing a lot say. at you. I know. So much. Which direction? Which direction? <laughs> I mean, I the thing about sustainable, I, I see health at every size as a sustainable approach to health and well-being. Mm-hmm. Um, so re, we, you can find way more research to back up the fact that people that are in larger size bodies that lose weight can have improvement in health in that span of time that they've lost that weight. So health at every size does not discredit all of those thousands of research studies out there. But what they do say is, well, what they look critically at and the critical viewer of those is that those studies don't go beyond two years. Mm -hmm. And the health at every size studies and all of the things that are backing up this research and this paradigm shift go two years and beyond. And that's because of what you're saying, which is that people can, the physical body, the human body can make these changes and lose the weight, but then it's not sustainable. And the actual weight cycling, uh, the, the weight down, weight up, weight down, weight up, which is what typically happens if somebody is on that pursuit of wanting to be in a particular size body that maybe isn't naturally theirs. Um, That in and of itself causes a lot of health concerns. And I guess I would simply just say that that in and of itself is a stressor on the body. Mm -hmm. And there's stress is one of the most important things to consider when you're thinking about weight. It was one of the things that's most strongly impacts our health, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And it definitely is a factor to be considered when we're thinking about um, weight and health. Mm -hmm. So, could you speak about Weight Watchers? Because Weight Watchers, I think, is yeah. going to be one of those play the the companies that is going to do it safely, maybe mm, and sustainably. No. And let's let's hear <laughs> let's hear your do thoughts you need on to throw out names. I don't want to be bashing. Yeah. Um, I would say that so so there has been a huge movement. So one of the things that originated where the health and resize movement came from actually was the non diet movement. Mm-hmm. Um, Karen Katrina, Karen Katrina, who came, uh, she's in Florida, and she was one of the first movements in the non diet movement, and. I find that it's now popular <laughs> to say this isn't a diet. So I mm-hmm. find that the Weight Watchers advertising right now is stating that, like, this isn't a diet. This is something that you can do long term. And um, and I, it, it's still, if if it's weight focused in my mind, those people are not actually given the opportunity to pursue true health because if they are doing all these things that actually I can't, I'm not going to disagree. Health every size might not disagree on the things that they're doing to care for themselves if they truly are listening and taking care of themselves in terms of movement and exercise and social and environment and work and you know, all these things and doing things to care for themselves. If they do those things and their weight maintains, let's say. Weight Watchers would, I think, I don't know, please, um, they, they wouldn't see that as success. But that, to me, looks like health. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, if this person is having improvement in health markers and all these mm-hmm. other things that are helping in their life to have them be well, but their weight maintains, uh, it just so often is going to lead somebody to stop whatever it is that they might be pursuing that's mm-hmm. actually helping their health. Mm-hmm. I think of the New Year's resolution time, like January, right. and how people will do things, and they say they're doing them in the name of health. But I would challenge that. And I think that most times people are doing a lot of things that they say are for health, but they are actually for more aesthetic purposes. Mm -hmm. And so if their body weight size doesn't change, then they stop doing the things. Mm -hmm. Um, And health every size just gives people an opportunity to truly be supported to say, yes, you are taking care of yourself. And I'm not going to use the scale, that number on the scale, to be a marker of if you are or aren't um, 
healthier than you were six months ago or well, even just well. Right. Mm-hmm. Healthy is, is such a loaded word, too. So. Mm-hmm. so that's why this is such a huge countercultural shift because mm-hmm. it's actually talking about what we've internalized as kind of the norm that we should be striving for, which is mm-hmm. typically this then ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yes, if you're exercising and you're truly going for a jog because you think it's a gorgeous day or you've been sitting at a desk all day and moving around mm-hmm. feels really good to you, that's a different story than running for the sake of my thighs need to look smaller. Mm-hmm. And so right. it can be maybe some of the same behavior. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know what mm-hmm. you'd say. Some of the same behavior, right. um, but for a really different purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this, we're going to get into that. Yeah, yeah. And one, I was just going to say one, <laughs> one thing to add on that, just as somebody who does the exercise and sport groups at Opal, um, a common question is, is it okay to exercise to change your body? Is it okay to exercise to um, body shape, essentially? And to go with what Julie's saying, a language that I tend to use is um, outcome. If you feel like you can mm-hmm. control the outcome, that's mm-hmm. where the problem is, right? Like what happens if you don't? You go, you go, you go weightlifting, you, you do whatever kind of movement. And what happens if you don't, if your body doesn't change in the way that, y- that you think it's going to? Yeah, what do you do to yourself right. in that moment? That would be the, yeah. the follow-up question I ask whenever someone asks me that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh my goodness. I feel almost like a little bit overwhelmed by yeah. how many different places this goes mm-hmm. because it is really talking about how to dismantle mm-hmm. an, a working mm-hmm. assumption in our yeah. culture. Yeah. It fires me up because it gives very mm-hmm. little respect to genetics. That part mm-hmm. is what gets me. Mm-hmm. It's like playing God of our body. Like we can really control mm-hmm. our body shape at all times. And that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I get mm-hmm. fired mm-hmm. up about that. I, I think the other thing that is a common pushback, and I would say that it also – is something that when somebody is really considering health at every size, uh, both maybe as a practitioner and considering this as a way they want to help people in their life in regard, you know, in so many different facets, or as an individual, somebody, mm-hmm. maybe a listener that's wanting to help themselves to think about these and apply these principles. The other piece that's, um, there's a lot of mourning and grief usually that comes with somebody that comes to a health at every size place and saying, I want to do this um, with this. I want to take care of myself from this paradigm shift. And Mm -hmm. why? Because not just that people might genetically think, I want to be something different. It also, it potentially, Health Every Size says, wow, my life up until this point, I might be 50, I might be 25, but up until this point, my life and whatever choices I've made and whatever environment I've been in and whatever stress I've been under and whatever you know, different diseases or conditions I've had have led me to the body I'm in right now. And at this moment in time, I'm desiring to choose health. And I am not going to allow for the scale, the weight, to determine if I'm healthy or not. And for many people, they think, well, people can lose weight. They should still lose weight if they pursue health, regardless Mm -hmm. of where they are. And I'm like, you know what? That's why there is millions of dollars in the obesity epidemic and obesity research trying to figure out, well, there is actually no pill or pattern of living or behavior that leads to sustainable weight loss for anyone. Anyone. There's no back for that. So I just think there's so many people that need to also face the reality that, yes, my life and whatever, whatever reason, all the multifacets, all Mm -hmm. the factors have brought me into this body. And it may be larger than what I genetically was born with, kind of Mm -hmm. is that why I'm coming off the offshoot of what just Kara said. is like, it may be larger than where I'm genetically supposed to, quote, or where I was to be when I was born. But now I don't want to erase. I believe that we can't erase our story Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and all of the years that we've lived. And what leads me into this size body and these scars on my body or this, whatever, this is the reality. Mm -hmm. And now from this moment forward, choosing health, I don't know what size body I'm going to be in, Mm -hmm. and I am going to allow myself to live into whatever body that is. Mm -hmm. Um, And for many people, I think part of the weight loss process is trying to leave behind and things that are hard and painful in life. And health at every size doesn't allow for that. It allows more of this is me, this is my full story, Mm -hmm. and this is who I'm going to be Mm -hmm. (laughs) in this world. And I, that's the part, too, that feels really – it's part of accepting a health every size paradigm. Mm-hmm. Right. It's so. actually an invitation into your body and your story at the mm-hmm. same and time. Pain mm-hmm. And pain. And yeah. the pain of that. And yeah. ambiguity. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, yeah. with with um, over control, as we talked about mm-hmm. in a previous podcast with mm-hmm. radically open dialectical behavioral therapy, I mean, the, the weight loss industry 
would really really capitalizes on our interest in um, accuracy and a, yeah, of like quantitative mm -hmm. um, simplification of health. And mm -hmm. here, I mean, just in this conversation, we just open this much more complicated, ambiguous yeah. um, dialogue around health. Mm -hmm. And this is not as maybe as uh, sexy as mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> the diet industry, weight loss, and all of the, the dream and the fantasy that goes into a yeah. diet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's going to be a savior for something. Yeah. yeah. I, I think what that speaks to, too, is just that with Health at Every Size, we're not anti-weight loss. Like, it could happen for some people as they pursue health at every size. We don't know that. Um, it's just really allowing there not to be a focus on if it's going to be up or down or maintain. It's having this mystery and ambiguity. And I don't know what's going to happen with your weight. And holding that as something that no expert can decide and mm -hmm. tell somebody, like, this is the weight you're supposed to be mm -hmm. at. Um, and I don't, I think, yeah. Yeah. And so it's inviting people to say, like, are you going to, are you going to care for yourself no matter what the cost is? Mm -hmm. And this is something that I feel like is a really beautiful parallel between actually doing therapeutic work, um, with a therapist and then doing therapeutic work around your mm -hmm. body and around your relationship to food. Mm -hmm. Will you accept the work that you need to do? Will you step into it no matter what the cost is going to be to your relationships or your body or whatnot and, and trust that, pursuing health and healing is actually going to be better for you than kind of restricting back into this version of who you've been, whether that's actually the the physical smaller mm -hmm. body mm -hmm. or the, you know, all the different ways that we might live our lives that actually kind of restrict us back into a version of ourselves that isn't as whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. I yeah. know. Oh, go ahead. Oh, the, the, thought on my mind is just that um, some people listening um, might say, okay, that's that's easy for some people to say that have thin privilege in this world. Mm -hmm. um, and some, some people are living in this world that is probably not going to change tomorrow um, mm -hmm. in terms of how much stigma and discrimination there is around size. And I think about that with our work with eating disorders. And I, whenever we're doing things around health at every size in our programming, I look around the room and I think these, pe these people very much so have chosen to avoid the oppression of weight stigma and size discrimination in and out through their eating disorder by, may by the orientation to food and exercise mm -hmm. and whatever they might be doing um, to avoid the oppression that is mm -hmm. true around um, weight and size mm -hmm. in our culture. And I don't blame them for that. Mm -hmm. I actually see it as really well-intentioned, and we all, I think, at some level uh, have done our dance with that. Right. Mm -hmm. and, I, and the way you put that, I mean, I think that it's impossible to not then bring race into the conversation as well, um, that, like, the thin ideal is a white ideal, and... To I mean, there's just like so much oppression in, in how everyone needs to then strive to one kind of version of a body and one version of living and one version of culture. Mm -hmm. And it's a sort of almost like an assimilation mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it might be easier mm -hmm. to stay thin or to stay small. But actually doing this work is rubbing up against the fact that there's so much injustice in this area and that... Mm -hmm. Um, we have to actually open our minds and change our minds about the way that we see the world and mm -hmm. see bodies and see people and see culture. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. like, can you look at a can you look at a body that is bigger or a different color or whatever and not associate it with um, all these things that are projected on to what you know what would typically not be an ideal? Mm -hmm. um, can you look at a bigger body or a body of color and not assume what that actually means? Mm -hmm. And then that bigger, even bigger picture, the reason why that matters is it circles back to love and connection, mm -hmm. which is like the fundamental human need that we all have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think people are don't want to ever burst that fantasy bubble because people will die for connection mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and love. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, to go back to the ROTBT. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet I think of like uh, living in a more, from a more haze perspective is it, it aligns with that open expression of ROTBT that it's actually being more fully yourself and more fully human 
um, to, to orient yourself in that way. Mm-hmm. Which does lead to connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Even though the, it's, connection. yeah, this is the kind of the dangling carrot over here is whatever the, um, if I look a certain way, I'm going to get love and connection instead of if I openly express and am fully myself, I'm going to have mm-hmm. love and connection. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm really proud of Opal because this is one of our stakes in the ground, right? The mm-hmm. health at our health at every size perspective, which is really different from other treatment, eating disorder treatment centers. So I don't know if maybe we could talk a little bit about that. It would be mm-hmm. interesting to me about what how Opal differs from other mm-hmm. eating disorder mm-hmm. treatment centers yeah. in terms of haze. Let mm-hmm. me take it. Yeah. yeah, take it. Yeah, I. Uh, the main thing that I would say is that we would never prescribe weight loss to anybody that would come to our program. Uh, but but the whys of that, I think back to our creation of Opal and us finding each other actually mm-hmm. just in our private practices and then the creation of that. And I think I said that actually in a previous podcast too, I mm-hmm. suppose. But I'll say it again. Um, but we just became kind of dis- became disenchanted with seeing how many people were getting treatment recommendations from other providers and other centers stating a particular weight size as their place they should be going and where they are and what their adult body would be. And it just continued to wear away at us. And so when we opened Opal, we knew no way, Mm -hmm. (laughs) no way will we, um, will we have uh, so much come, come from such an expert stance and so much certainty around weight that we would have a lot more mystery and ambiguity around weight and allow for it to be something that really brings in complexity and process um, versus just this answer of like, well, this is what you're supposed to be. So if you're there, I guess you're recovered. Um, so what else would you, would you guys fill in? I would probably add um, something that you said to me earlier about um, fat phobia. Oh. And just adding that as part of the conversation, can you be fully recovered if there's mm-hmm. still this underlying right. fat phobia yeah. within you? Yeah. Um, if you're scared of of your body looking a certain way? Have you been able to actually deal with the different um, assumptions that you're making about how you should be in your body and what's okay and what's not in the world and what you're hiding from and running from and the box that you're squeezing yourself into? Yeah. That's also something I think that's different about us is that we turn towards those conversations, even mm -hmm. about our own bodies as as staff and um, Mm. that we're willing to talk about how clients are having reactions to our own our sizes and shapes and um, that we're just like kind of yeah ready and willing to get into those tough conversations. Mm-hmm. We've had, the three of us have had tough conversations mm-hmm. about that when we first opened. There was, mm-hmm. um, I think, just continuing to go to the places of dysregulation and self-inquiry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. That's true. Yeah. And I, I think to kind of say more um, about within the treatment context, we, we serve people with all diagnoses and they come to us in a variety of shapes and sizes. And with that, it's people are then interacting also in our treatment program, seeking, you know, recovery from their eating disorder and then interacting with people of different sizes. So if that's staff or mm-hmm. if that's their own peers in treatment, and I love the richness of that. And I have always felt that it's been a disservice to health at every size that many people just want health at every size. Oh, yes, the, our people with binge eating, right. which is cr- jumps to a huge assumption and, and right. a huge stereotype right there about people what that with body binge eating, like. what that body looks like, which mm-hmm. just gets me fiery. And then, but anyways, oh, yes, oh, yes, we, we use health at every size with our binge eaters. And I'm like, no, what about? no, yeah. no, everyone no. with an eating disorder, anyone that has this fat phobic belief or fear around fatness needs to consider these things, needs to consider where those thoughts have come from, where those fears are and where the, what they want to do as they move forward in life and in interacting with other humans and their own body. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I, um, I just believe there's so much utility for health at every size for all um, eating disorder diagnoses and at all levels of care. Mm-hmm. So you know, ours is partial hospitalization, so people can be even more intensive treatment, but we're still with people for 50 hours a week, right? So they're they're needing to interrupt their life to get care. And I still think, yes, some of them come in and their brain is certainly not fully nourished and there's stuff that still isn't 
you know, but I still feel like, yes, start diving into the stuff right away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, why not? And I just find that that yeah, throw them the research articles and <laughs> have them, you know, get mad in nutrition mm-hmm. education group when we talk about these principles, because why not now? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so I, I really, and I get so excited when the clients start to verbalize it themselves and they start to respond mm-hmm. to the newer clients that then have been gotten through their process yet and I love hearing it mm-hmm. being able to be something that people take in and start mm-hmm. to see the world differently and see others differently and see their bodies differently mm-hmm. and I would say for many people they're seeing their own bodies differently is going to be the last right that's the venture part. right yeah. but they can see health at every size being applied to everyone else that they love and know right mm-hmm. <laughs> um their children and right. and their peers and their spouses but it's it is it still is of course a hard thing to um for those that struggle with eating disorders often to mm-hmm. apply this to themselves. Mm-hmm. I think though one of the reasons they're willing to face that pain and suffering and the ambiguity is because they've seen what hasn't worked. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's often that is which is steering them into a possible alternative um, because they know over and over what their life is involved with, with restriction or mm-hmm. with eating disorder behaviors to change their body. Mm-hmm. And they're, mm-hmm. they're just kind of they can be feeling like done with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I imagine that could be true for some of for you listeners too, of this might be a scary um, idea and yet it could be something that there might be openness to because of what hasn't been working. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yet it, and yet if someone hasn't hit bottom with it, mm-hmm. I think it's, of course, I know you're saying this too, that it's still such an important exploration around yeah. like, what is it that still feels fine about holding this ideal for Mm. yourself and for your body. Mm. Um, And there's so much to unpack in that. Yeah, Like I had mentioned kind of, you know, how race and whiteness is part of that. Also, like, what is it about the male versus the female body, Mm. right? That there's an ideal of like hard edges Mm. instead of like the softness that might come with some fat under the skin. Mm. (laughs) You know, like that too is just kind of, uh, it just breaks apart all these different paradigms um, of, of what, what particular genetic makeup is acceptable mm-hmm. and um, can we start seeing our bodies and the world with wider eyes mm-hmm. um, to, to know that there's different ways of seeing and mm-hmm. different, um, different beauty to see in every single mm-hmm. story. That sounds a little mm-hmm. bit cliche, but mm-hmm. um, it's such a paradigm shift that, yeah. that I don't think people have to step into unless they hit bottom sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but, there's so much more healing mm-hmm. and um, space to think about the world in a more complex, nuanced mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. Um, when you're able to start breaking this stuff mm-hmm. apart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And rem- you would, oh, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to say, I remember my own experience um, in my recovery process around fat phobia and just looking for ways to actually have my eyes kind of see things from a new perspective. I remember going to, um, I was visiting a friend down in Southern California Whoa. and yeah, <laughs> already on the beach. So loaded. Yeah. yeah okay. On the beach, on the beach. And, um, I remember literally saying to her, can you tell me what you see? You know, can you mm-hmm. describe the bodies that are going by us on the beach and the swimsuits mm-hmm. and tell me what you see in each of these bodies? Cause I, I, I wanted to understand, I knew my eyes, um, we're seeing something from such a jaded standpoint. And so I, I wanted to, I wanted to know what it was like as in this trusted friendship of, of what she, what she could see on the beach. And that was a really, mm. you know, obviously that didn't <laughs> completely resolve my fat phobia, but it was a starting point of just mm. believing there's a subjectivity to this. And I wanted, right. I knew, I think, I think I was driven to wanting something bigger and less narrow. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then I started interacting with more images and photography and, um, exposing myself to way more shapes and sizes and looks and mm-hmm. and asking myself questions why why did I even you know what what was it about the thin the body that I was even drawn to um, yeah yeah it unpacks Where so much it story yeah. right right yeah I've been thinking about that a lot lately too and um, I mean as in two different ways like as an artist. Um, doing like figure drawings of the body mm-hmm. and actually looking for the beautiful line on any body type and actually getting to put that on page. Mm-hmm. Such a different process and accepting. 
even how much more interesting sometimes yes. one body can be to draw over another, just in terms of my own preference, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, it's not necessarily the like supermodel every mm-hmm. time, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and then being able to look at my own body in the mirror and saying, oh, that line's kind of nice. And mm-hmm. oh, that, okay, like that's beautiful too. Mm-hmm. Um, more through an artist's eye rather than this like really mm-hmm. critical, hard-edged, black and white mind mm-hmm. um, that had been there before. And such a healing place, mm-hmm. such a healing place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like some of where this conversation has gone too is – talking about body acceptance Mm -hmm. and sort of body positivity, uh, which is definitely an offshoot, I guess I would say, or like a sister Mm -hmm. (laughs) to health at every size. Um, And I, that's, it's such an important part of everyone's process, I think, too, is doing, having those conversations and thinking through that. And it's interesting because I've found too in my work that not everybody who is in the body positive kind of body acceptance world actually believes in health at every size. Mm. Um, so, and I don't know if I'm interesting. Yeah. Just yeah. because people could be very accepting of a body, but they might still look at it and say that body is unhealthy. Mm-hmm. I might find beauty Aesthetic in it. Aesthetic versus mm-hmm. health. Yes. I might find beauty in that, but mm-hmm. there's no way that person would still have sort of the fat, the, the, the um, associations, right. To right. fatness um, that they would see in a certain body. So mm-hmm. I find that um, it's, yeah, it, like oh, there's so many great people out there that are blogging and doing these things around fat um, acceptance and body positivity, and I'm always keeping my sort of uh, mm-hmm. eye on it in terms of what they might say in regards to health and weight and mm-hmm. nutrition and fitness mm-hmm, in relation totally. to that. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Just to state for the listeners, the definition we use of body acceptance is that you care for your body, you do self-care behaviors for your body. So that could be nutrition, hydration, friendship, take, um, taking care, going to the doctor, right? Like all those things that we care for our body, um, despite any of the feelings you have. So you can have the full range of emotion, hatred, love, um, neutral feelings. So you have the full range of emotion and you can experience a lot of emotion towards your body. And yet you still take care of your body despite the emotion. Mm -hmm. I love hearing that. It feels mm-hmm. so much more relational mm-hmm. um, from the get-go, that it's not like a conditional thing. Right. Not conditional, not just on what, on how your body looks, but also how you might feel about it a certain totally. day. It's like, like relationships, right? Exactly. It's like the, you keep showing you know, up. Yeah, totally. You keep showing up. Mm-hmm. And yep. like, yep. Mm-hmm. I love that. You can have all the feelings, but you're still caring. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's reading with respect. Mm-hmm. I, would, I wonder if some listeners also might think, well, then – well, can I make decisions about nutrition and exercise that, like, how do I then make decisions? Mm -hmm. Can I? Can I think about that? How do I make, Mm -hmm. what do I decide to do that? And how do I decide that that's for well-being? And how do I know if that's for well-being? And And I think that can get really confusing. I mean, I think when people are going, and I Mm -hmm. remember this in my recovery process is I don't, I didn't know. I was like, I don't know if I'm being disordered or if this is a good intention there was a period of time that things were really confusing in terms of my own motives because there is was so much bias I was working through. And I think that it just was it. until you you have more and more experience to build that confidence of why you know mm-hmm. it, why you know what you're doing. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. the behind the the why behind it, your mm-hmm. intent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think so much of the tenets of health every size with eating for well being and the enhancing life enhancing movement are really so personalized. And Mm -hmm. I would say that the health at every size movement has so much around that in in terms of nutrition and exercise and really just other health practices. I think we have to allow for not to be space for healthism too. Like each person can pursue what level of health and what that even means for each person. Such a good point. It doesn't actually mean that it's absence of, I don't know, irregular lab values from the doctor, (laughs) like everybody's perspective on what is health is different. And so just thinking about that in um, the the process of helping someone adopt a health at every size approach or is is really having oneself, you're knowing yourself better Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and experimenting with listening to one's body in regards to hunger and fullness and um, integrating knowledge that you might have about your genetics and your taste buds and your food experiences to then be able to land that into a place that feels like, oh, this is what works for my body in terms mm-hmm. of how I want to mm-hmm. eat. Um, so I I think it's – and and those those practices of 
of each person coming to know what works for their body can improve health. So health exercise doesn't say that nutrition and exercise doesn't help and enhance mm-hmm. health. It, it so and I think sometimes people might think oh they don't they don't care, care about food or right. um, but it's just that it's it's not as prescriptive and it's way more of a personalized approach that allows for each person to come to it on their their own um, and again not having it be that they're making a decision mm-hmm. for this to lead to weight loss or for their um, um, make a choice around exercise or nutrition that would impact their body weight to make it fit more into the ideal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Such a wonderful um, shift from kind of obsession still around food and body Mm -hmm. into a much more nuanced way of living where the whole story about who you are is still not dependent within health on their health in every size on how's your body doing? What are you eating? Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, well, you know, how are these other components of your life that will impact your body? How are those things going? Mm -hmm. Um, And it's so... I think it's so rare to mm. to not kind of just project all of that onto body size and to what's going into your mouth. Mm-hmm. It's revolutionary, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know if we used the phrase yet today about um, the social determinants of health. Mm-hmm. Have we said that yet? No, I don't no. think so. Um, but I think of that as something that's such a key um, phrase that I learned definitely when I came to Health at Resize, just understanding, okay, there are so many social determinants of health that we have to recognize, socioeconomic status and race and culture and environment. And I, this this one handout that we have that just has everything from, I don't know, where playgrounds are or um, abuse access history, to access to food. Mm-hmm. It could be mental health. It could be I don't, it, it's just thinking about, there are so many uh, factors. And I, I yeah, it, that is something that um, doesn't get the time in the 15 minute doctor's appointment, mm-hmm. perhaps, right? When yeah. somebody comes in and is getting their checkup or wants to get some advice for back pain, they don't get time to ask them maybe all about how, are, what's your mm-hmm. home environment like? Are you safe? Are you, um, what's, yeah, giving them creative ideas about career you know that's not happening right Right. but um, that 15 minutes and so nutrition and exercise like that's what ends up getting thrown at people so quickly about that um so it the complexity as you're Mm -hmm. saying carter it it just it opens up so much Mm -hmm. and we have so many more questions or um yeah questions than answers when it comes to um things that come to us i guess from clients too when they Mm want to explore more around this topic Mm -hmm. it's usually more questions than it is specific answers of of where is the cause of health issues or what is what what well what really does cause weight gain then Um. (laughs) and it makes me just I can't help when you start talking about that to think about the kids and how Mm. they're learning these things in school and health and PE class and we just got through my kids Mm -hmm. both just got through their week of their health classes and I love our PE teacher and she's been very (laughs) open-minded to feedback but the curriculum right is is more it is going to give you more the facts and more prescription and um there's less space for exploration for these kiddos so Mm. it's I mean gosh what how different would our world be if that was the way Mm -hmm. the kids got to learn around it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I wish I wish I wish I wish Mm -hmm. It'd be such a dramatic shift. Yeah, mm-hmm. I actually, I, I couldn't help myself, but I, I talked to the, this last assignment my oldest did. I, I had, I asked the teacher if we could adapt it, and she was open to it. So, <laughs> cool. we adapted the lesson. I actually had Julie come talk to my daughter about it too. Wow, because she, she likes Julie. Aww. Thought it would be fun. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But just that was much, much more exploratory, like this versus mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. recount the food you ate in the week, put it into food groups. And talk about quantity, and then and a- analyze your food. Basically, was oh, the God. is the it was the lesson. <laughs> and of course, they're trying to teach. They're you know they're they're trying to teach some basic nutrition things, but yeah. there isn't room for kind of the how mm-hmm. our preferences, like who we are as eaters too. That's more nuanced. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted that's I wanted wonderful. Sophia to have that. That's so <laughs> wonderful. Mm-hmm. 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 I was remembering something that you said, Julie, about um, how. Haze can often be seen as, as like this trump ground or trump card or like this sort of holy ground um, mm. by other people. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, and yeah. 
was just thinking about that kind of in this mm-hmm. conversation as we're talking about nuance and complexity. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. What does that mean? Yeah, do you want to say that at all? Yeah, I mean, we have decided as as Create an Opal and how we hire and how we oh. treat our clients is like this is this is it. Like mm-hmm. we're going to present health every size. We're going to make sure everyone that works at our place aligns with this. And it's just this idea that I think in in some approaches to psychotherapeutic work or nutrition counseling, it would be very client centered, client led, mm. and that like somebody might come in and say, "I want weight loss," um, and then some providers would then follow their lead in that way and do what they, you know, what feels good to them in terms of weight loss and pursuing that. And that's one of those things that for us, we just have always said right up front, (laughs) it's very clear um, that that's not what we're going to do. And we can't, and we would never um, try to have somebody not have that desire. We want for people to feel very open in our space saying, I still want to lose weight. I still am not comfortable in this body. We are very comfortable with people sharing that and being open about that. Um, but the reality is that we're we're not going to just stop there and say, you're right. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> we need to help you do whatever at whatever cost to lose that weight. So I think that we hold such a firm stance. I think I think for some might feel like we are saying that we know we have the answer. We are the we have it an- all figured right. out and you must go this way. And what I love about Health Every Size is that it it is a, a paradigm, you know, mm-hmm. and it has some tenets to it. But within it, it's so much personalization. And the main thing is it's just moving away, not allowing weight to be that, not to be the, the holy ground mm-hmm. in some ways. Mm-hmm. Like right. not weight be the answer right. to everything. Right. Um, Letting nuance be kind of be yeah. The, yeah. the story. Yeah. So, I, mm-hmm. I mean, we were talking, Carter and I were talking about it. And I just felt like I, I don't know any other way because mm-hmm. I, I can't. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel like holy ground to me. I don't feel like I'm being an expert it, and like holding my way above other people at all, I just feel like it's compassionate and mm-hmm. it is respectful. allowing, yes, and respectful. It's kind. Mm-hmm. From our it's non judgment. I feel very yeah. non judgmental. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And that's, you know, one thing I would yeah. say is, you know, in, in, in intake, if someone comes and says they want to lose weight, we would be clear that that's not, we don't, we don't do weight loss diets, but mm-hmm. I, I think we all, we feel a lot of respect for people's ability to make their own decisions about their lives and maybe yeah. they're not ready for, the a haze approach and, and yeah. we I guess I, I want to just make sure that's mm-hmm. clear we respect that and respect mm-hmm. that that's a, that's a lot of times where people are in their process and they may never find haze or they may turn to haze at some point in their lives but, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah 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 and in that sense with it being a paradigm shift I think that my like circling back to that was just this this curiosity around the fact that it's um it's not a prescription. And I think people are kind of expecting mm. um, some sort of treatment philosophy to still be really prescriptive. And mm. in that in that sense, it would be like, okay, this is the end all be all. But this is actually, I feel like Hayes is something that is um, saying, can we open the conversation actually into these mm. other spheres? Mm-hmm. And once you start opening the conversation into other spheres, that does kind of determine how open the rest of the conversations are going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's more of an umbrella that's holding all these Mm -hmm. different questions Mm -hmm. rather than um, prescription. Yeah. 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 Well, this feels like maybe a natural time to end. Okay. Um, I'm sure we're going to be, I don't know. There's so many different ways that this conversation can keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, and can I just for the listener? Can I say the five tenets of health at every size? Yeah, in one yes. little s- blurb. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Just as a quick little summary, <laughs> cool. um, because I felt like I emphasized a couple of them and not. I don't. Know. Yeah. Uh, so, but that I said the summary in the very beginning, right? That health at every size supports people in adopting health habits for the sake of health and well-being rather than weight control. But then the five principles within that are weight inclusivity, which really speaks to the BMI, the health enhancement which speaks to supporting health policies that improve and equalize access and the social determinants of health. And then respectful care is the third principle. Um, And looking at the social justice issues that underline and intersect, as Carter was speaking to in terms of race, and looking at all of that. And then the other two that I mentioned a lot, which is a life-enhancing movement and eating for well-being. Mm -hmm. So those are the five principles of health at every size. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Yes, I appreciate that. And can be found at the ASDA website. um, And we'll put that link for people to be able to get to. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.
Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. And thank you to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering, to Aaron Davidson for the Appetites music, and to Opal's Sarah Taylor for production assistance and editing. You can find more episodes and subscribe on iTunes. And you can find more out about Opal at opalfoodandbody.com. If you'd like, connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Talk to you next time.